27-year-old Donna Settlefield owned and operated her own beauty salon off the State Highway 221 in Roebuck, South Carolina. She was also the mother of two children and had recently separated from her husband Mike. At around 6.30pm on the 31st of July 1995, she bought a bottle of cleaning fluid from a door-to-door saleswoman named Shirley. At 8.11pm, Shirley passed by Donna's salon, saw her cleaning up and waved to her. She then went on to visit two other stores. At 8.30pm, Shirley returned to the salon to wait for her ride home when she heard strange noises coming from inside. She then saw the lights turn out, heard a very loud sound and saw a man jump out one of the windows. She ran to a nearby liquor store to call the police. However, she crossed paths with the man in front of the liquor store. Fearing for her safety, she ran towards the street to flag down a motorist. When that was unsuccessful, she ran to the nearest house and called the police. A deputy sheriff arrived at the salon and found Dana's body in the closet. She had been beaten, raped and strangled. Authorities ruled out robbery as nothing appeared to have been stolen. Her husband Mike was investigated and eliminated as a suspect. Authorities believe that the killer was a predator and possible serial killer who may have stalked her. Another witness named Ken Smith later came forward. He was driving past the salon at 8.40pm on the night of the murder when he saw a suspicious man nearby. The man was standing next to a car and gave him a dirty look. Based on the time frame and description, it is believed he was the killer. Despite the witnesses, no one was ever arrested in her murder. A $50,000 reward was offered for information in the case. Police first suspected that Dana's estranged husband, Mike, was the killer. His fingerprints were found on the water heater, which was next to her body. However, he told police he installed the water heater. It's also noted their breakup was amicable. Furthermore, he did not fit the description of the suspect. They also looked into the possibility that he had hired someone to murder her. However, they couldn't find any evidence to support the theory. He was no longer considered a suspect because of the brutal way she was killed did not match a professional hit. Police suspect that the killer may have stalked Dana. They also believe that he was a predator and possibly a serial killer. A composite sketch was made of the suspect, who was 18 to 25 years old in 1995, 5 foot 6 to 5 foot 9 inches tall and around 145 to 170 pounds with blonde or light brown hair. They believe he drove a Ford Bronco with custom rims and out-of-state license plates. After investigating thousands of leads, in October of 2005, authorities arrested a local man named Jonathan Christian Vick and charged him with Dana's murder. He was also charged with kidnapping and criminal sexual conduct. Authorities have investigated Vick back in 1995, when he was 17. They didn't have enough evidence to connect him until witness, his friend David Pace, came forward. He claimed that on the day of the murder, Vic told him he was going to meet with Dana that night. David told police that Vic had threatened to kill him if he told anyone about him visiting her that night. David was overcome with remorse years later after meeting with Dana's daughter, so he then decided to go to the police. Authorities matched semen from Dana's body to Vic's DNA. It was discovered that Vic also matched the physical description of the suspect and owned a Ford Bronco with custom rims. He also had been a customer at Dana's salon prior to her murder. His girlfriend claimed that after the murder, he drove her to the salon and said that if she didn't listen to him, she would end up like that woman. Furthermore, while he was in the Marines, he assaulted several people and was known for having a violent temper. At Vic's trial, the defense noted that a pubic hair on the body did not match Vic. However, it was noted that the murder took place in a men's bathroom, meaning that the hair may have been left by a customer. In December of 2006, he was convicted of the charges and given a life sentence. In 2010, he was placed on prison lockdown after he assaulted another inmate. He would not be eligible for parole until 2035. Vic was also a suspect in the 2002 disappearance of Michelle Whittaker until she was found alive and well in 2008. He was also a suspect in the disappearance of his girlfriend, Heather Sellers. Missy Monday was a 15-year-old honours student and a member of the Future Homemakers of America. She lived in Hancock, Maryland with her family. According to her mother Phyllis, she only left home to go to church and ball games. In 1986, a man in his early 20s named Jerry Strickland arrived in the area. He claimed that he was looking for a property that he wanted to convert into an orphanage. He contacted the Mondays, asking about the ownership of a nearby house. 
Phyllis felt that Jerry was a smooth talker and did not care for him. Missy was intrigued by him. They began seeing each other. Each time he visited, he brought her a gift. According to her friends, he gave her the attention she wasn't receiving at home. She went out with him after school and lied to Phyllis, claiming that she was with friends. She regularly snuck out of the house at night to see him. He told her that he had a tragic past and that his wife and child had died in a terrible accident. On the morning of the 17th of April 1986, Missy left home to catch the school bus. However, instead of doing so, she was picked up by Jerry and left the state. She had no idea that everything she had been told was a lie, that he had a wife and child that were still alive. He was also writing bad checks, had a serious prison record, and had been convicted of malicious assault. During this attack, he had raped and nearly stabbed his sister-in-law to death. Missy and Jerry settled in Springfield, Michigan, and had a son named Jamie together. She kept in touch with some of her friends in Maryland, but didn't tell her family where she was. She told her friends that she didn't care about her family anymore except for her older brother and grandfather. She claimed that she went with Jerry because he took her away from her family. Her friend Sherry noticed they never kissed or held hands and claimed he wasn't very affectionate. To make ends meet, she got a job as an assistant manager at a nearby gas station. She became friends with the 38-year-old Alma Duboa, the crew for the oil company who picked up the cash receipts from the local gas stations. On the morning of the 11th of May 1987, Alma came to pick up the money from the station when he was near the end of his route. He was never seen alive again. About an hour later at 11am, the station was discovered deserted and the front door locked and his car still in the parking lot. Inside, the safe was found open and over $10,000 was missing. Authorities believe that Missy and Jerry robbed Alma when he entered the station and opened the safe. They believe Jerry handcuffed Missy and Alma together to make him believe that she was also a victim. He then took him into a wooded area a few miles away to show that he wasn't going to hurt her. He then shot Alma twice in the back of the head. His body was found the next day, 20 miles from the station. The morning after the murder, Jerry and Missy were seen in Pontac, Michigan, where they bought a truck using small bills. For two hours, she sat with an auto salesman alone and didn't tell anyone about the murder. This led authorities to believe she was willingly involved in it. Her family and friends are shocked that she could be involved in such a crime. At the time, Jerry was wanted for armed robbery, kidnapping and murder, while Missy was wanted for questioning in the case. The case was first aired on a program called Special Number 5 on the 5th of February 1988. Within minutes of the broadcast, 20 viewers called the police to report that Missy and Jerry were living in Moses Lake, Washington. Seven hours later, they were arrested at a friend's house. Incredibly, they had watched the broadcast and were waiting for the police to arrive. During the time on the run, Missy and Jerry had another child. On the 12th of February that same year, they were sent back to Michigan to stand trial. Jerry was interviewed by Unsolved Mysteries and insisted they were innocent. However, Missy later stated at the trial that although she didn't witness the murder, he confessed the crime to her. In exchange for her testimony, the murder and kidnapping charges were dropped. She served seven months in a juvenile home for armed robbery and was released when she turned 19. She then moved back in with her parents and children. Jerry was convicted of murder, kidnapping and armed robbery and is serving two consecutive life sentences without parole.